Hi, I'm Jill Dynas with Stanford Center on Food Security and the Environment, as well as NASA's Harvest Program. And today I'll be talking about subfield yield estimation with satellites. How good is it and what can we learn? And first I wanna point out that um, my work really focuses on retrospective yield estimation, looking at historical analysis, which is a little bit different than the related problem of making in-season yield predictions. Um, and kind of the purpose of this is from my mind twofold. One, you can't manage what you don't know. In order to manage resources into the future, you need to understand the past. And so by having long historical data sets, you can analyze yield gaps or yield heterogeneity and figure out what type of interventions might be successful. Um, real quick, because this talk has a couple different pieces. Uh, first, I'll be talking, introducing our yield mapping approach that we use in our lab group, um, and then presenting a new evaluation and some improvements to it um, applied in the United States Corn Belt using an extensive ground truth data set that we were uh, lucky to get to use. And then I'll show an application and answering the question, how does conservation tillage affect yields? So my lab group uses something called the Scalable Crop Yield Mapper, or SKIM, which is first presented in um, the paper LaBelle et al. 2015. And so the problem a lot of times with satellite yield estimation is that ground truth training data is hard to acquire. And so the solution for SKIM is to use pseudo observations from crop simulation models. Um, and so what that looks like is this. So we, we parameterize a bunch of different crop simulations to capture the key features of the study system. And so you get all of these possible crop trajectories. And from that, we derive just simple yield regression models, um, predicting yield from the satellite greenness or GCVI um, along with weather. And so then, and when you have a crop mask and satellite data and gridded weather data set, you can then apply this on a pixel level to any region with any satellite system um, to give you annual subfield yield maps. And so one of the key features about this really is its scalability. Um, and, and so here I just presented just a couple applications that have happened to date. Um, on the left is in the US Corn Belt for 20 years using Landsat data across nine different states. Um, and on the right is um, a work by, Zin, by Zinong Jin um, looking at smallholder systems in Kenya and Tanzania um, using Sentinel. Um, and so what I've been working on a lot in the past year is um, this opportunity we have for subfield level validation data um, with a really extensive ground truth data set. Um, and so this data set comes from combine harvesters that have a yield monitor on them. Um, and so as the yield monitor uh, harvest, you get kind of real time map of the field yields. And so we have these maps for over 1 million field observations. Um, and we kind of sampled that down to 400,000 to equally represent space and time in our data set. So what this looks like, um, the data looks like on the top here is the yield monitor data set, which we processed to be kind of a standard five meter yield map grid. Um, and on the bottom of the corresponding Landsat-based skim yield estimations at 30 meters. Um, and so this example on the left is an example where uh, qualitatively, visually, they match quite well. Um, these examples on the right are examples that we also see of disagreement. Um, and so you can see this, the central example, um, the satellite yield map is kind of the opposite pattern of the yield monitor. And then on the right, these fields here kind of match relatively well, but you have this stark difference um, where the yield monitor field has very low yields for some reason. Um, and so we use kind of this messy data set to look at how to do satellite yield estimation most effectively. Um, so one question we asked was what phenology metrics perform best? And traditionally, um, SKIM has used a two window approach where we took the maximum observation um, for an early season and late season crop window indicated here in gray. Um, and so that performed um, relatively well. We were using R squared and RMSE a, a lot to evaluate these different ones um, with about 0.3 R squared. Um, and we went through a couple different iterations and we found that using a harmonic regression to smooth the time series um, and then deriving the integral for the shaded region um, helped improve the accuracy the most. And that's kind of what we went forward with from there. Um, another thing we were curious about was what would be your data needs 
if you did have a ground calibrated machine learning model um, to perform kind of similarly to, to the scalable method. And so for this, we did a two-stage sensitivity analysis um, where first we varied the number of training samples between 50 and 200,000. Um, and then we restricted those samples in space um, to either a single state or a single year to then test the performance outside the training data um, when we tested on the test data set across the full 11 year time frame and the full region. Um, and so what we found here on the right um, on this plot, you can see the training sample size is on a log axis on the X axis. Um, here in red is the accuracy we found from SKIM. Um, and so um, not unexpectedly, the more training samples you have, the higher your accuracy goes. Um, and about 1,000 um, training samples would give you accuracy similar to SKIM if those training samples were randomly sampled throughout the time period and region. Um, but when you restrict that to either a single year in blue or a single state in pink and then apply it to the whole region, um, your accuracy drops quite a bit. Um, and so I think this is helpful for two reasons. One, generally even having a thousand ground fields um, can be difficult to acquire, but particularly having them over a, a, a full decade is pretty rare. Um, and so it really demonstrates the value of having a scalable approach and what the crop simulation models can bring. Another thing we were really interested in was trying to understand if satellites can help inform yield gap analysis. So we were curious how the satellites picked up yield differences along different management and environmental gradients um, compared to what you could see with the yield monitor data. Um, and so here the top row are examples of some management um, decisions we looked at. We had some data from fields just in 2018. Um, and so you can see in general, SKIM is tracking these relatively well. Um, and then we also looked at some, some soil responses. Um, again, pretty good tracking. Um, and it's worth noting that there's no soil information in the SKIM models as they're applied. Um, so it's really kind of picking this up basically from the crop greenness. And then also uh, climate variables. And so in general, we found similar responses. And in some cases, SKIM had a smaller response than the yield monitor data. Um, for instance, here along this line of soil quality, um, yields increased as soil quality increased, but it didn't quite see um, register as much as the yield monitor data. So some of those effects are a little muted. Um, but overall, we thought this was encouraging as far as using satellite yield estimates to do these yield gap analyses and being confident they're capturing something that's going on on the ground for elements that aren't in the yield monitor, the yield model. Um, okay, so now I want to turn and kind of switch gears and look at an application um, asking the question, how does conservation tillage affect yields? Um, so conservation tillage is promoted a lot as part of conservation agriculture. Um, and one of my favorite demonstrations of the benefit of reduced tillage is this um, Soil Your Undies campaign, um, kind of a social media awareness raising um, gimmick where the idea is that you take two pairs of underwear and you bury them in fields that are under different management. And then after a certain period of time, you dig them back up and you see how much of your underwear are left. Um, and so in this example here, this long-term no-till field, you can see the underwear almost completely decomposed. Um, whereas in a conventional tillage field, um, they're just uh, dirty and, and a little holy. Um, and so this demonstrates kind of one of these first benefits is that you improve soil microbial health. Um, it also has benefits for water retention and infiltration as well as lower costs as far as fuel, labor, machinery, and of course it reduces erosion. Um, it's still uncertain though how tillage affects yields. Um, so this gets back to the reason why you would do till your field in the first place. Um, so it can break up compacted soil, control your weeds, mix nutrients, um, and also warm and dry the soil so you can plant your crops earlier, which leads generally to higher yields. Um, in a global literature, literature review, um, they found that no-till can actually reduce yields about 5%, um, especially initially. Um, but a lot of this was done from work and research plots, and there's some reason to think that doesn't necessarily capture um, real live uh, production scale tillage fields. Um, so this leaves an opportunity to combine earth observations of management practices and yields to understand these impacts at the production scale. Um, and so what we did is we took um, some data sets that have been produced by our lab group, um, largely using Google Earth Engine of annual tillage maps, um, as well as annual crop maps. And, and here I'm showing maize in the US Corn Belt. 
Um, and so here I'm not really going to talk too much about the generation. We already talked about how, how to make the yields, yield maps, um, but I'm not going to go into the tillage map generation, but I want to talk about the challenge of doing causal inference when you have two large observational data sets from satellites. Um, and so the first challenge is that satellite drive data sets are messy. Um, here's an example of a tillage classification, which has about a 79% classification accuracy, um, which isn't phenomenal. Um, and so you can see here, you can definitely see it's picking up kind of field entities, but there's a lot of speckle there. And the other problem is it's not a randomized trial. So there's a potential for sampling bias, um, particularly if um, a situation like this diagram shows, if you tend to have higher yielding, yielding fields choosing one practice over the other, you could have kind of a bias in your data. So we addressed this in two ways. For the data, for the, for the messy data set problem, we just did some filtering. And so we went, went from the overall map and then we had some criteria, like it had to have pixels that were consistently classified for the full time period um, and were in kind of coherent field groups. And so we got what we were pretty confident were long-term fields having the same management over the time period. Um, and then for the sampling bias, we used a, new met a newer method um, by AP et al. Um, in 2019 paper, machine learning um, for causal inference. Um, it's called a causal force. And so it's basically a random force that's adapted for causal inference. Um, and so um, with all the fields, we extracted different field attributes from available layers. And so the causal forest framework basically matches fields with similar attributes and sees what the yield difference is um, based on tillage practice there. So what we found was that on average, reduced tillage improved maize yields in the region by 3.3%. Um, and you can see there's some variability around this average treatment effect, including some areas with a negative effect, um, as well as some areas with a really strongly positive one. Um, and so this comes from over 150,000 field year observations. Um, and when we, we kind of compared that with underlying environmental variation, uh, one of the interesting uh, results that popped out was that we saw strongest positive yield effects occurring in drier late season conditions. And so that kind of gets back to how uh, reduced tillage can promote soil health and, in, and, and improve water retention in the soil. Um, another thing we found is that this positive impact accrues over time, kind of similar to, to, to the global literature review. Um, and so for this, we did a slightly different approach where we took fields um, from the data set that switched practice once during the time period. Um, and so then we looked at a 2017 cross-section of yields. Um, and so each field had a treatment number of years since they switched. Um, and so um, in this plot, like here, the 3.3% is the uh, treatment effect uh, for long-term fields, whereas this new field effect per year was much reduced. And so again, you're getting this effect growing stronger over time as fields uh, kind of soil rebounds and farmers um, improve management practices. So in conclusion, we found that reduced tillage has a minimal and typically positive impact on yields, which demonstrates that it can really be a win-win for agriculture. Uh, we also found a leg response to reach these full benefits um, and overall demonstrated the utility of earth observations for agricultural assessment. Um, so because we had this large field data set, we we're able to detect this relatively small yield signal um, amid year-to-year -year variation in yield. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to the question period and if you're unable to attend that or get me there, you're always welcome to shoot me an email or find me on Twitter. Thanks.